this morning I'd like to share a poem with you. It's called The Opening of Eyes by David White. That day I saw beneath dark clouds the passing light over the water, and I heard the voice of the world speak out. I knew then, as I had before, life is no passing memory of what has been, nor the remaining pages in a great book waiting to be read. It is the opening of eyes long closed, seen for the silence they hold. It is the heart, after years of secret conversing, speaking out loud in the clear air. It is the vision of far off things. It is Moses in the desert, fallen to his knees before the lit bush. It is the man throwing away his shoes as if to enter heaven and finding himself astonished, opened at last, falling in, fallen in love with solid ground. We light our chalice this morning in the spirit of opening eyes and the end of silence. A reading from the Reverend Olympia Brown, Universalist minister. In 1863, she became the first woman ordained by a denominational body. This is an excerpt from her sermon, The Opening Doors. Today, we are not dependent upon any text or the letter of any book. It is the spirit that giveth life, and the spirit speaks to our souls with every breath that blows. Thus, earth and air are filled with proofs of divine love, goodness, and power. The mountains and the hills have spoken, and the rocks and the soils have added their testimony. The opening doors lead to no dark dungeon, open upon no burning lake, give no evidence of everlasting punishment, but all gladden us with assurances of divine goodness and indicate the final triumph of the good. Not only by the researches of science are we shown the glories of creation, but the scenes of beauty which daily greet our eyes, the song of birds, fragrance of flowers, the moonlight shining on the waves, all tell the same story of divine love. And this is the message which I bring you today. Stand by this great faith which the world needs and which you are called to proclaim. We shall speak the language of universal love, and it will be heard, and the message will be carried far and wide. Have before you ever the vision and assurance of the salvation of all souls. Universalism shall at last win the world. A reading from the Reverend Emily Wright Magoon. We talk in Unitarian Universalism about our vision of the beloved community. This is what that vision is about. A world where all of our inherent worth and dignity, all of our marvelous variety and beauty, all of our diverse gifts and potential are given air to breathe, nourishing love, and the gifts of supportive community. The Me Too movement has gained steam because we are finally talking about the people, almost always men, on the other side of these stories. Some of them are finally facing the consequences of abusing women. This is hard stuff, stuff our culture doesn't want us to think about. Often, defenses arise within us. Not all men, and, but some women lie about it. And it's not just women who are assaulted. And, but that man is a good man. Maybe so. But these defenses distract us from the bigger reality. We must learn to see sexism and toxic masculinity in the air we breathe. It's in our conscious and unconscious behaviors. This is on all of us. And so the cure is in all of us too. We do not have to continue to be a culture of toxic masculinity where boys learn that a successful man gets his way whenever and however he wants. We do not have to continue to be a society where locker room talk is acceptable, where boys don't cry, where male loneliness is an epidemic, where some men turn to assault rifles and mass shootings to feel powerful. So what do we do? Listen to the stories at the margins. 
if we are men, especially to the stories of women and gender non-conforming people, if we are white, especially to the stories of people of color. Teach boys, it's okay to cry. When we see a girl, don't always say, what a pretty dress. Give space to men to feel. Stop interrupting women when they talk. Teach consent. We tell our stories. We trust they count. We listen. Sometimes what seems like an ancient concept, an old idea that is dusty and idle and seemingly useless comes to life again. What the world needs, said Olympia Brown, the first woman ordained in the United States in 1863, 1863, is to see and proclaim the beauty of this world, the beauty of all souls, and the hope and the embrace of universal love Universalism will at last win the world, she said. We're still working on it, Olympia. We're still striving for the beloved community. We're still hoping and living and working for the final triumph of the good, and we've got a lot of work to do. At the end of September in 1770, John Murray preached the first Universalist sermon in America. At the time, it was a radical message where the dominant theology of the day made people fear that their very soul was just dangling over the burning coals of hell, and they had to believe the right thing or act a certain way or give enough of their money to save their soul from eternal damnation and everlasting punishment. Murray and others, like Olympia Brown, called BS. And they and others believed that all people were sacred, all people were beloved in their language, all people were children of God. And that, like the ancient hymn we sang today, is a deep belief that God or spirit or whatever you define as sacred or holy is where true charity lives, is infused with compassion and love, that that is the very definition of any type of God there is, not some omnipotent being or patriarchal bearded dude, but the most ancient ideas of God or the holy was a belief in spirit, in energy, in presence. Whatever showed up in the world as love and compassion and as courage, as hope, as justice, and whatever God or the spirit was, the universalists proclaimed it was rooted in universal and unconditional love for all people, but most importantly, for the neglected, the forgotten, the outcast, and the ignored, because it was in response to a world that disparaged and ignored vulnerable people with no power, and it was trying to lift up those cast aside. Murray said, go out into the highways and the byways, give the people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it, let it shine. Use it in order to bring more understanding and light to the hearts and minds of humanity. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. Preach the kindness and the everlasting love of God. There's an old phrase defining the difference between Unitarianism and Universalism. Unitarianism lifted up the goodness of humanity. Universalism lifted up the goodness of God. So the phrase goes, that universalism believes God is too good to damn people, and Unitarianism believes that they are too good to be damned. <laughs> so this whole question about universal salvation, which is central to universalism and John Murray and Olympia Brown, the idea that all souls, in the words of our own church's historic statements of faith, will end in final harmony with the holy, is an old and complicated question about what salvation is at all, this old, dusty sort of word in liberal religious circles. Salvation comes from a root word, solteria, meaning wholeness, healing, well-being, like the salve for a wound. It's much less about a personal guarantee for a life hereafter, and much more about a sense of wholeness, of connection, and of liberation, personal and communal, in this life here and now. At a young adult group a few years back, we were talking about salvation and universalism, as, as you do in young adult groups. 
we broke open the, well, when you're with me, so you broke open <laughs> the word, we broke open the word a bit, and we got into a brief history of hell, what universal salvation was railing against. So in short, a brief history of hell. Hell was a construct, like many things used in fear and religion, developed by empires to control and manipulate people with fire and brimstone to fear and obey those in power. It was hijacked from earlier meanings when hell, like heaven, was considered and discussed as an experience in this world, here and now. Originally, hell comes from the Greek word Gehenna, which is the literal place. It's a place outside of Jerusalem where crucifixions were and where the refuse of the town of Jerusalem were. It was a trash dump. It was a place, Gehenna uh, translates to the place of the skull. It was a metaphor for decay and disease and death, and so throughout the biblical scriptures, when they refer to hell, it's Gehenna. It's the trash dump outside of town. The whole idea of the rapture and the fearful apocalypse was from the book of Revelation, but in fact, that too was, guess what? A metaphor written by John as he was exiled as a coded critique of the Roman Empire. For example, the number 666, which we equate with Satan, is a numerological equivalent for Caesar. And heaven was described as welcome to the stranger and economic redistribution, the collapse of the empire and tyrants, particularly Rome, and freedom of the captives. So the apocalypse, the end times, all that fear boils down to this. Satan is Caesar, hell is oppressive empire, and heaven is the collective liberation of all people. The end. So that's universalism. So in recent weeks and months, and really in recent days, this message of universalism, the idea that we can believe in love and we can believe in people, especially those whom the world has cast aside or ignored or discounted, has taken on some new meaning. We still live in a world where many are not treated as sacred, where stories are not listened to, identities are discounted, degraded, desecrated. We don't believe the truths they tell because we don't want to believe what it says about our world, what it says about ourselves. Universalism can be a hard thing in these times, it's not a belief, though, that people are perfect, that everyone is a good person, that people shouldn't be held accountable for actions. In fact, in some ways, it's the opposite. Universalism is the belief, as one philosopher says, the line between good and evil goes through the center of each human heart. That people are fallible and can at times be evil. And in the moments when a person or the earth has been desecrated, degraded, discounted, universalism teaches two things. First, that as we hold people accountable, we do so humanely, thereby preserving the dignity of all involved, but not refusing to hold people accountable. It's in the phrase, when they go low, we go high. And the second thing, and the most important and regularly ignored part, is that we treat the story of the person wronged, the story of the oppressed, the story of the marginalized as a sacred story because it too quickly gets trampled on. Because universalism teaches that people are sacred and when their life is desecrated, their testimony becomes living scripture. That when a human soul is desecrated, discarded, discredited, universalism is the belief that there is some larger love holding them however you define it, reminding them of their own courage, their own strength, their resilience, their light, their story, and that by sharing it, in these old universalist words, giving something of their vision, uncovering their small light to let it shine, to give more understanding and more light to the world. By those listening and bearing witness to it with respect and compassion, and belief we have the power and the capacity to squelch the burning lake of Gehenna with the sobering waters of truth, to give people not hell but hope and courage that the small light that we each possess can shine. Universalism helps to tip the scale and bend love toward those to whom love is a stranger in this world, to lift up the marginalized, the oppressed, the ignored, to shine a light on their identity and their story and their life until the world believes in them and the world believes them. 
Professor Christine Blasey Ford, testifying to the Senate Judiciary Committee, shared these words as part of her opening statement. She said, I'm not here today because I want to be. I am terrified. I'm here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened. She said, for a long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone. I didn't want my parents to know that at age 15, I was in a house without any parents present, drinking beer with boys. And I tried to convince myself that I should be able to move on and just pretend that the assault had never happened. She says, thousands of people who have had their lives dramatically altered by sexual violence have reached out to share their experiences with me, thanked me for coming forward, and at the same time, my greatest fears have been realized. I've been called the most vile and hateful names imaginable. I've received constant harassment and death threats, and my family was forced to move from our home. She said, I've been accused of act acting out of partisan political motives. Those who say that do not know me. I am fiercely independent. I am no one's pawn, and my responsibility is to tell the truth. I don't know about you, but I've had several colleagues, friends, loved ones, women in particular, who have responded to the testimony from Dr. Ford saying she is speaking for all of us, and that's why we can't breathe right now. There can be no final triumph of the good until enough white privileged men begin to believe the stories they are, they are hearing are not centered on them and begin to disbelieve the stories that are put in place and they've heard all their lives to protect them. And they stop gaslighting the public and inverting stories of oppression to make themselves out to be a victim. We are at a time in our world, thank goddess, where the cis hetero patriarchy is beginning to crack just a little. Activist William Barber says before a mule dies, it kicks hard and patriarchy is kicking hard. Another activist said about the response to the allegations, this sounds like a eulogy for patriarchy. May it be so. And it's not about just this instance. It's about systems of oppression. Our cultural responses to the stories of victims and in particular of women. And in this instance in particular, it's about patriarchy that is trembling and fuming in the face of truth and humility and resilience. It's about patterns of not believing stories of survivors, not believing stories of people of color, of people of, with dis disabilities, of indigenous people, of gay and lesbian and trans and queer people, of Latinx people, of immigrants, of refugees, of not believing their stories and assuming that because you are a good person, that because you worked hard to get where you are, that you can't even begin to notice the amount of entitlement and privilege that is suffocating your best self like a smog of safety. This is about a larger truth, a larger love being told as a normative story, and it's beginning to crack something that is strong and that is rigid and that will make those who cling to it mindfully or subconsciously tremble with rage and with fear and with grief and with excuses in the midst of trying to paint a picture of themselves as judicious, as tempered, as professional, as good. Because they are imprisoned too, whether they know it or not, by a system and a narrative that they have been told their whole life, that they are good, that they are decent, that they earned everything they own, and that things in this world are simple and assumed. The intensity of the day and the emotions in it express something deeply troubling, but also resilient and strong about our culture. As Adrienne Marie Brown says, things are not getting worse, they are getting uncovered. Universalism landed on the shores in a time of theological smog where marginalized and oppressed people were told that their stories, their experiences, their souls were depraved. The air was stagnant, and it isn't until 
The stories are told and the truth is preached. It isn't until someone hears a narrative, a new possibility, it takes someone with courage to speak for the wind to begin to blow at all, for the air to begin to clear, for there to be enough room in the midst of the smog for a fresh new story of truth. And there's finally enough room for other stories to be told that for a thousand reasons were kept silent and there can be a newfound identity in hope and in courage where someone else who needed to hear the courage of someone else telling a story finally finds the wind that had been knocked out of them come back into their lungs. That they stop breathing for a moment but then life comes back again because you need some fresh air for the lungs to be able to sing freedom is coming. Yes, I know. Universalism will not at last win the day and the air will stay stagnant and stuck in the smog of safety for some and obscurity for others who choke on it until men stop interrupting women and mansplaining everything and stop being silent in response to the epidemic of sexual harassment and assault that has been around for centuries and to name it as a symptom of toxic masculinity and that there is a change in male culture that is needed and that having the last word and making themselves the victim when their system of privilege begins to crack even a little, regardless of innocence or guilt, it's how you respond to the story until we stop the excuses and we finally say, I believe survivors, I believe women, I believe in the stories of the marginalized and the oppressed, and so does universalism. And I believe there are more stories and there is more love and we're gonna keep on finding it. May it be so, and amen. I wanna pause for a second on our normal benediction practice. This has been a week of triggering and traumatization for many in our culture, constantly in the media. So I invite you to raise your hands toward the sky or over your heart And remember to never assume someone is comfortable being touched. And when we practice this in the future, I invite you to just keep that in mind as we offer our hands in open invitation, but without assumption. And I invite you to breathe deep the breath of life. In 1863, She said there is more love somewhere. And we've been searching and finding and losing and searching again. And we're going to keep on till we find it. And we're going to listen to the stories we've ignored. And we're going to find a more beautiful, just, and equitable world together. May it be so. Amen.